Welcome to the 7220 Sports Kickoff Show. Here are your hosts, Cody Tucker and Jared Newland. Welcome to the 7220sports.com kickoff show presented by the Brown and Gold. This show is also sponsored in part by Dickie's Barbecue Pit, Wyo Lotto, Papa Murphy's Pizza, Rocky Mountain Shirtworks, and Lovejoy's Bar and Grill. There's no position that's probably more scrutinized than the quarterback position, and that's just the lay of the land. Andrew realizes that. Uh, he's He's been resilient. You know, playing him against App State, when we look at it now, I don't know if he was quite ready. His arm strength was not... It was functional, but it certainly wasn't where it is now. And, uh, you know, the numbers that we've seen in practice, the competency, our completion percentage, his decision-making, seeing the field has gotten better and better and better. And I thought his performance Saturday night, uh, you know, was a breakout performance. He's been good. But, I I mean, there was one of those throws. I mean, it was like a league throw. I mean, it was a laser. And uh, so it was great to see. And I know he's playing with a great deal of confidence. It's a bad, bad, bad week to be an Andrew Peasley hater, Jared. (laughs) He is uh, playing lights out recently, uh, last two games. Uh, They called a players-only meeting after that App State debacle. And, uh, boy, this offense has looked completely different. I'm Cody Tucker, joined as always by Jared Newland. What has been so different about Andrew Peasley over these last two weeks? I think he's he's feeling more comfortable in the pocket. And when he does get outside of the pocket, he's he's delivering. Yeah, put it that way. Um, remember a few games here and there, he would do a dump pass that would go into the ground about five yards in front of the running back, things like that. I think the only pass that I saw that should have been completed that was on Andrew against Fresno State was a little dump to the tight end that was just like, how did you miss that one? Yeah, I was like five feet in front of you. Right. But he did. Right. Uh, but overall, I think he's – you can't – I don't know if you can say this about a six-year senior, but he's like grown into himself. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. last couple weeks. Yeah. It's just a different Andrew Peasley, and a lot of it is I think he's just more comfortable and and hats off to the offensive line. Yeah. Because they're giving him time, and I'm sure that makes Andrew feel a hell of a lot better than getting hit all the time like he was against an App State. Texas Tech. Uh, Texas Tech. I mean, he got smoked several times in each of those games that probably would have put a lot of guys out of the game. Absolutely. Uh, another hat tip to uh, Mr. Tim Polisek, Wyoming's offensive coordinator. I think he's really he's really dialed it up these last two weeks. The Cowboys have been anything but one-dimensional. Uh, they're coming out throwing the ball. It's It's short stuff. It's good stuff. It's high percentage stuff. Uh, just like they did when they beat Air Force a year ago. Do you think that he's flipped the switch on the headsets and just ignoring Craig? Or maybe Craig <laughs> has flipped the switch and said, Tim, do your job. I think Craig has uh, ultimate trust in Andrew Peasley. And last year, I think you and I, probably a lot of people just say, you know, you always hear, uh, it was his first year in this pro-style offense and yada, yada. It's true. There's something to that when you're not used to taking a snap under center and you're not used to playing with tight ends. Half the time, there's three tight ends on the field at the same time, and he never played with one through high school or at Utah State. So it took some time. It took some time here, and I think also something Craig's been bringing up a lot more, there's way more playmakers on this team, way more. Uh, Asante is a playmaker on the outside. Wyatt Wheeland, another guy who's a lot like Peasley, finally coming into his own here. It's it's unfortunate. He, he did a little bit last year, showed some flashes. It's unfortunate that it's their last go-around, but they're playing to their potential right now. And speaking of getting smoked, he yeah. got hit yeah. hard in the end zone and held on to that ball. He made a play for his quarterback, didn't he? Yes. Andrew Peasley, 19 of 27, 183 yards passing, three touchdowns. All of those throws came in the second quarter. Uh, he was 8 of 10 to start the game. Uh, of course, Wyoming uh, rolls to 5-1, and 2-0 and overall in Mountain West play on the brink of the top 25 after that 24-19 win over number 24 Fresno State. Cowboys on a three-game winning streak, and so much of this has to do with Andrew Peasley. Um, over these last two games, Jared, 377 passing yards, four touchdowns, one on the ground uh, for five total, completing 67% of his passes, and he's added 59 rushing yards, which those rushing yards are meaningful. It's not everything broke down, I got to roll. It's I'm rolling around the pocket, and I'm going to pick up some big first downs. And once again, hats off to Tim Polisek for yeah. quarterback – student body left and quarterback student body right on those two calls because everybody in the stadium except for the that offense and Tim Polsek 
thought the ball was going to Whaley yep. both of those times. Whaley was the lead blocker. Yeah, absolutely. And it was just great timing on those. And yeah, hats off to those guys for that and getting it done. And the execution of this offense you know, as a whole for two straight weeks. And people are saying, well, yeah, but they, sh- they got shut out in the second half. Give credit to Fresno State. They made some adjustments. That's the number 24 team in the country. And they have a hell of a defense. They do. And Wyoming was putting them, especially the offensive line against the defensive line, was pancaking those guys and putting them on their asses the entire first half. Yep. And they made adjustments and and did what teams are supposed to do, make adjustments at halftime. Exactly. And, man, it's it's amazing how many times fans forget that there's another team on the other sideline. And A 5-0 it, and o team. And is it still a 1-0, and o, a W for the week? I mean, seriously, who cares how it gets done? They yeah. won the game. Yep, it's getting done. Andrew Peasley, a big reason for that. He was named the Mountain West Player of the Week. He's now 5-0 and o this year as a starter, 12-5 and five overall. And as much griping as there is about the senior signal caller for the Cowboys, 12-5 and five overall. And last year, he wasn't, he was a dead duck at Fresno State. You might as well scrap that one. That was just a bad loss in general. They even said it. <laughs> yes. Um, Ohio, I, I don't think he was ever fully healthy uh, last year and still 12 and 5 overall. Um, just, I, I think the guy gets so much flack and it's just, it's unwarranted, man. All the guy does is win. He's an absolute competitor. So uh, big ups to Andrew Peasley and this Cowboys team. Um, Rolling into uh, rolling into Air Force this week. Uh, here's Andrew talking about what you just mentioned. How good his offensive line has been. Here's Andrew Peasley talking about the time he has to survey these last couple of weeks, especially against Fresno State. Yeah, I think we came out uh, ready to play today. I felt like I had five seconds to throw the ball. I, you know, I seen the field really well. We had a really good plan for Fresno and their defense and. Just coming off last year, you know, they kind of got us on some on blitzes, so we had all these looks dialed up. Um, they brought some of it, and then they, they did a lot of bail zone, too, and we had a plan for that, too. So I think we executed really well. Um, guys were flying around. Obviously, you know, the second half is uh, it's tough. we got to stay on the field. I think we only got three real possessions um, in the second half. The fourth, I think it was the fourth one. Grind, you know, we're trying to run the clock out. So uh, we got to be better in the second half, and we got to stay on the field. Defense played really good, too, so. You know, Jared, there had to be something to this players-only meeting. Um, and I've tried talking to a few of these guys. They're not giving me anything. They don't want to talk about what they talked about. But the overarching theme was, who do we want to be? And I think we've seen in spurts these last two weeks against New Mexico and Fresno State who they want to be. And they're efficient, man. They're efficient, and they have so many weapons. They have they have weapons at the tight end spot, the wide receiver spot, the running back spot that they haven't had around here in a long, long time. Well, you know, with completing nine passes or passes to nine different receivers two weeks in a row, yeah. that tells you something right there. Absolutely. And John Michael Gilmore probably should have had one that was called a touchdown in the first half. <laughs> that I can see why they didn't. If, but if it was called a touchdown, it would have stood, stood, I think. And he said the same yeah. to me. Uh, Gillenborg, speaking of him, he said, man, I think Peasley only had three incompletions in the whole first half. And he said they were all to me. And he's like, I owe him. I should have caught every one of those. Which, that's him just being self deprecate he, he, Some of those were overthrown. They were misses. Yeah. But, man, if he hits those two, you're talking about a picture-perfect first well, half. The one stat that stood out to me, other than being up 24-7 to seven at halftime, was the first downs was 22 to four yeah. in the first half. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Even if Wyoming was up 50 to nothing at halftime, I don't know if I've ever seen. Yeah. Because you have 22 first downs and you've only scored 24 points. That means total ball control. Long and the, drives. and the time possession was yeah. totally in Wyoming's favor. Um, Fresno state only had six total plays in the first quarter. Yeah. I don't know if I can remember seeing that other than maybe the Air Force game last year exactly. when, because Wyoming went on a 12-minute drive. Yep, yep, uh, exactly. That, that, I'm just crazy stats in that, in that first half. How about some crazy stats that Fresno State came into this game with? 11 straight quarters of scoreless football against the Wyoming Cowboys. They had scored at least a point in 25 straight quarters, and they hadn't gone three and out in 40 straight drives. And it that, was- 
all went to help. And it happened back to back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no, that all went to help. We're giving hats out there. So hats off to the Wyoming defense Absolutely. in that first quarter for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, also they were on a 14 game win streak. That, that, that team over there that is getting zero credit for that second half, um, they're the defending Mountain West champions. Uh, they may not have had the strongest strength of schedule coming into this game, but they're five and zero. Jeff Tedford knows how to win the big one, and uh, the Cowboys punched them right in the face and just did enough to hold on there at the end. Luckily for them, absolutely. And you know, hat, hats off to the to that Wyoming offensive line once again for getting the rushing game. You may think that well, it wasn't all that effective. Well, it was effective enough because 130 yards total. And that was a defense that was only giving up 82 yards on the ground a game. And on the flip side of it, Fresno State was averaging over 100 and whatever it was. I can't remember. Wyoming only gave up 38 yards rushing. 38 yards rushing. You're not going to sustain any drives doing that. 1.9 yard per carry. Yeah. Incredible outing by those guys. And you said it in one of your articles that Devon Harris only had one. They, They keyed on him big time during that game. And he only had one tackle, but boy, was it a big one. Yes, it was. It was a sack, folks. <laughs> it was a sack that forced a field goal and knocked Mikey Keene right out of this game. Um, and who knows? If Mikey Keene's healthy throughout the fourth quarter, who knows? But Fife is a great quarterback. Yeah. I mean, he, he showed that last year when Haney went down. Yeah. Because he was out for three or four games. Fife came in. Yep. And yeah, they did go on the road and lose that first game after that. But then they got going again. Mm. He, he's, he's an effective quarterback. And he's going to need to be because he's uh, the man again. Yeah, <laughs> Mikey Kane's done for a little while. I think he got twisted up pretty good. Um, before I get past this, I uh, want to talk about the players only meeting a little bit. Uh, Craig Bull told us last week he does not like players only meetings. They turn into town hall bitch sessions. That's his words. Um, however, this one is different, he says, because. When you have the leadership you have of fifth-year and six-year guys that this team does, uh, captains on the offensive side, Trayton Welch, Wyatt Whelan, Andrew Peasley, these guys have been through the fire. So he knows that he can trust those guys to not go in there and turn it into a gripe session. Um, And apparently whatever was said in there has worked. Uh, here's tight end Trayton Welch when I asked him about these player only meetings and what has changed since. It's a you know it's a player's game at the end of the day. The coaches have been doing a great job of laying out a game plan and everything in between. And um, you know the coaches are just stress. It's a player's game. You know when Saturday game time rolls around, kickoff rolls around, it's a player's game. So um, just to be able to have, like I said, the group of guys that we have, and to be able to have that meeting was, meant a lot to us. Um, as you might call us leaders or whatever, but it just meant a lot to the offense as well um, because, like I said, we know um, what we have right now, and so we, we just want to strain to finish and, and get 2% better every day. So far, so good. I think the Cowboys' offense has looked great. Um, not one-dimensional. We're not seeing this one-dimensional stuff. Uh, oh, by the way, burying the lead hard here. I'm hearing that Harrison Whaley likely is not going to play I- against Air Force. Big loss for the Cowboys there, but... You know, it's cliche, you put it on T-shirts, but next guy up, I think uh, this team thrives on that. And like you mentioned before we came on the air, they're, they really, I hate hearing it. It drives me nuts. It makes my spine just curl when I hear, we're one and we're going one and this week. It's true with this team. This team is so mature. I don't know if I've seen a more mature Wyoming team, to be honest with you. And I've been following the team for a long time. And just the way that they prepare um, both mentally and physically every week. They just come out and play football. They're, they shut out all the outside noise. And, you know, they were picked, you know, middle of the pack in the so-called no divisions, but they still, yeah. you know, middle of the pack type of deal. And this is a team that just gets ready every single week. And now now that this win against Fresno State, I mean, loomed so big, this is the next big one. <laughs> and who knows how Wyoming would have reacted if they would have lost that game, but we don't, we don't need to we know don't that. Care. We don't care because <laughs> they won the game. So they're going to be as prepared as any for any game this year. And we know that they do a very good job against Air Force. Air Force has a better defense than they've had in a long time. We understand that. And without Whaley, if he does not play, um, you know, it's next guy up, like you say. But the passing game... To the short, those short passes to the running backs, the slot, whether it be the tight end, what you know, whatever it is, it's an extension of the run game. You've heard me say this many and many times, 
And, um, you know, there was two passes to the running backs, or excuse me, um, three passes to the running backs last week that were completed. Yeah. And you're probably going to see a few more of that yeah. coming up. Definitely. Um, today in the game. So, and who knows, you might even see a player that hasn't played yet this year from that running back spot. Are the Cowboys going to be okay without Harrison Whaley? I truly believe they will be uh, because of the play of Andrew Peasley and getting getting the pass, those passes to those open receivers. We saw Sam Scott. We saw what he could do against Texas Tech in spurts. Um, it's not that he's in the doghouse. It's not that any of these guys are in the doghouse, Craig Bull says. Um, it's just Harrison Whaley's that good. That's why you've seen – the number of reps certain guys are getting. It's nothing to do with Sam Scott not being a good running back or Jamari Farrell not being a good running back. It's Harrison Whaley is that dynamic. Um, I personally am looking forward to Sam Scott playing in this game. He he looks to me like he would be a star Air Force running back. Does he not? He does look like a Brad Scott type (laughs) guy, doesn't he? Yeah, so I could see him having a big one. Uh, I just think this offensive line, too, they're motivated. Uh, They don't they don't like Air Force. The, this team does not like Air Force. They never have. Even talking to a bunch of former players, just even recently, because I'm helping put together a reunion for the 1993 WAC championship team, and they're like, oh, yeah, Air Force this week, huh? Oh, don't like those guys. And I'm right there with them. I, mm-hmm. I even get to the point, especially this week, where I think I dislike Air Force more than I do CSU. <laughs> and that's hard for me to say. <laughs> that's lofty. Um, just – the way they play, their arrogance, the stuff that they get away with on and off the field. I mean, by and it's, some of it's not even sports related. It's just stuff that's swept under the rug. Sure. And, I, and the coach, Mr. Howdy Doody, we all know about that. <laughs> He's just an arrogant guy. And you even said it when you were at Mountain West Media Days the last two years. Even his own players don't want to sit with him. None of the other coaches go sit with him during lunch. No, they don't. And his players don't even sit with him. He sits by himself. Yeah. It's because nobody likes the guy. He's brutal. And I've had some really nice conversations with Troy Calhoun one-on-one. He, the thing I like about him is when you sit in front of him in a setting like Mountain West Media Days, he'll go, who are you? Where are you from? Um, what are you? How long have you been doing this? No other coach is asking you anything like that. And Troy Calhoun loves baseball, so if you talk any kind of baseball with him, he'll talk your ear off. I watched his press conference yesterday. It was pure pain. Uh, their beat writer down there at the Gazette, God bless him, I can't believe he's been doing this job as long as he has. He asked Calhoun, like, how come Wyoming, of all teams, has given you so many fits over the years? Uh, I believe Calhoun's 9-8 and eight all time against the Cowboys or something like that. Um, he went on a little rant about I don't know what I don't even know how to explain it to you guys it was a rant about something like they're a heavily resourced program and we're a federal school and it just kind of he leads he leads you down these rabbit trails and then just stops and you're like okay <laughs> a little Bill Belichickian a, li- a lot <laughs> a lot uh, he's not giving anybody anything and you know I hear I get it. I hear a lot. Air Force is the best college football team in Colorado and they have been for a long time but the media never wants to cover us. The media never covers us from the Denver Post or from anywhere in Denver. So it, we're just forgotten about. No, you're not exactly media friendly. Uh, your coach isn't exactly putting his neck out there and inviting and saying, come come down here. Come down here, Denver reporters, so I can tell you all about our great football team. He never does that. He's the one who's hurting them. Fisher to Barry on the flip side, beautiful human being. Just a great guy. Hilarious, outgoing. Troy Calhoun is none of that. Going back to Fisher to Barry. When he was still coaching, Joe Glenn was at Wyoming, Sonny Lubick, oh, CSU. That front range kickoff luncheon. The best. Couldn't get a ticket to it. Yeah, I went. I was lucky enough it to go. It was so fun to go to. And all Wyoming fans. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was sold out every year. <laughs> yeah. And those guys took shots at each other, but in a good way. Yep. They're all good friends. Yep. They were all in the same age bracket for the most part. And just throwback football coaches. It was the best. I talk about that all the time. Could you imagine if that was today, how boring that would be? Oh, yeah, it'd be terrible. It'd be terrible. I mean, even Norvell, a nice guy, but it wouldn't. I wouldn't go to it, even if somebody no. gave me a ticket. I don't think I would go to Bull it. Bull would be the most outgoing of them all. He'd be the funniest one of the whole bunch. But it's still dry humor that we've all heard the same jokes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I remember, I believe it was Sonny Lubick who dropped a funny joke. Him and uh, DeBerry were kind of teaming up on, on Joe Glenn. And they were like, man, it's nice to see you. I don't think we've ever seen a Wyoming coach here for two straight years in a row because it's usually me and Fisher and whoever – Wyoming's coach happens to be that year. <laughs> oh, two, three and out coaches, that's why. <laughs> you know, that was great. I'm glad you brought that up. Those were those were a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, we have a couple minutes here before the break. Uh, speaking of Calhoun and, and the talks I've had with him, I ask him and I almost implore it, and I'm 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 hoping to talk it into existence, I guess. And I and I can't believe I have to fight for it so hard. Is this a rivalry? You're damn straight it is. <laughs> it's an emphatic hell yes, it's a rivalry on our end. And I understand where he's coming from. It's the two academies, you know, our Army and Navy. Of course, that those are priority. But if he doesn't call this a rivalry with it only being three games separated over all these years yeah. and how close a lot of these games have been and the fireworks that have gone off during the game and post-game, yes. for crying out loud. The comebacks, yes. the, the big ups. I wrote about it today, the 2002 upset. When they came in here, ranked 22nd in the country, and Wyoming tore down the field goal post. That was Vic Coning. That was the game in the Vic Coning era. Mad Dog yelled at me after that game. Because <laughs> he had to go get a field goal Yeah, post? because I, I said, <laughs> Dog, wasn't that win great? He goes, no. I said, well, why not? He goes, well, Jim and I have to go down to Oklahoma and get new field, uh, goal posts. <laughs> and I was like, Mad Dog. Our fans needed this. Let them enjoy it. So bad. I'll drive with you if I need to. <laughs> I'll go get them. <laughs> I'll walk to go get them. That was one of the greatest greatest memories for me in this series, and that's why I wrote about it today. It really, I stuck with that team through all the bad times, and I, I wrote a little uh, anecdote in my story that I remember seeing Patrick Chuck Wura in the lobby of the hotel in Provo, Utah, before the, the night before the BYU game, and he literally looked at me and said, "Why are you? Why? Why are you here? Like, why did you drove all the way here from Cheyenne to watch our team?" And I'm like, "Yeah, because one day, one day, this thing's gonna get turned around, and you bet your ass I'm gonna be in the stands when it does. And it could be tomorrow. And the Cowboys gave BYU hell that next day, but those were some lean, lean, dark times at the University of Wyoming. Yes, sir. Uh, so it is a rivalry. Um, I don't care what." Troy Calhoun has to say about it. Um, I do remember him saying they just got out of a coaches meeting in Vegas and he said, we made sure to preserve the Wyoming Colorado state game and the Nevada UNLV game when they got rid of divisions. That was the main two. So now every team has two protected rivalry games. Rivalry is probably not the right word, but two protected games for Wyoming. That's CSU. That's air force. Obviously they're not playing Utah state this year. Those two teams are protected. So Wyoming will play those two teams every year, no matter what. Um, and I asked him what his thoughts were on that. He goes, yeah, Wyoming and Colorado State, that's a great rivalry. They have to play every year. I said, what about Wyoming and Air Force? Uh, it's a game we want to play well in. I said, what about Air Force and Colorado State? And he's like, um, you know, that's another game we want to play well in. Well, it's one of those things, too, if he actually did the financials on the games, he knows that ticket sales are big yeah. for the CSU and the Wyoming games for both Home and away. Absolutely. So, and it's something that all fans can drive to. Yep. It's great for for college football is what it is. I know when you ask me as a in my past life as a Wyoming lunatic, you'd say, what teams do you want to beat more than anything in the world? It was four. It was Wyoming, or it was Colorado State. It was BYU. It was Air Force. It was Utah. Those are the main four. Always. Air Force is always in that for me. Uh, we're going to go to a break here. Uh, when we get back on the other side, we'll break down this Air Force team and some staggering stats they have. They have all day R5-0 and o coming into this. They are also knocking on the door of uh, the top 25. Huge, huge game tonight in Colorado Springs. We'll see you on the other end of the break. Welcome back to the 7220sports.com kickoff show presented in part by Wild Lotto. When the pokes win, you win too. Learn more at wyolotto.com. Challenges, I, I think we beat ourselves. Uh, if anything, I think the only type way we lose is we beat ourselves. Um, as long as you take care of um, what we have going on in, in our locker room, I think we'll be just fine. That was Air Force running back Emmanuel Michelle with some bulletin board material for the Wyoming Cowboys. The only way Air Force is going to lose this game is if they beat themselves, Jared Newland. Do you agree? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> now that that's uh I'm gonna say it ballsy yep. for him to say that to the media, which he knew it was gonna get out. And I am actually very surprised that Troy Calhoun allowed him 
in that media room if he had any bit of inkling that he was going to say something like that. <laughs> but then again, Troy's an odd duck. Maybe yeah. he fed it to him too. Then again, it kind of sounds like a rivalry. <laughs> but somebody <laughs> down south I-25 doesn't think so. Yeah, weird. Uh, you know, I was looking through the bull era against Air Force. They have met um, eight times previously. Uh, bull has a... Bull has a, is four and four, I believe. I don't have it in front of me, sorry. Uh, but he's four and four against Air Force. Um, the Falcons are averaging 411 yards per game this season. They're also averaging nearly 38 points per game. During the Bull era, the Falcons have never scored more than 31 points against Wyoming. Uh, just once back in 2018, they rolled up more than 400 yards of total offense. Uh, in that same game, the Cadets rushed for more than 300 yards. That's the only time that's happened since Craig Bull has been on the sideline in Laramie. That's impressive stuff. Very. And hats off to the defensive coordinator, whoever it may have been at the time, because Wyoming's been through a few, a few. during the Craig Which Bull era. Which is a good problem to have. It they're is. losing yeah. them because they're so good. Yep. Uh, but they know how to prepare for this Falcon offense. And last year, you were told that they were preparing for it. In spring. Spring. And then, you know, during so-called two-a-days, don't call it that anymore. But I'm sure that they probably did it once again this year really not knowing who was going to be at quarterback, who was going to be at running back and things like that. But they have a pretty good idea what they're going to do. Yeah. And this quarterback does pass the ball probably more effectively um, than they've had in a long time. Uh, but you have to also remember who in the heck they've played so far. Yeah, they're off to a 5-0 and start, 127th schedule, ranked schedule in the country. Robert Morris, who? Yeah. Sam Houston State. I lived in Pittsburgh. That's the only reason I know that Robert <laughs> Morris is there. Sam Houston just <laughs> moved up to 1A. Yes. They were a pretty good team in one, you know, in FCS. FCS. Yeah. Uh, got to a championship game, had a really prolific offense. But Air Force only beat them 13 to 3. And I know the game was in Houston mm. and things like that. But still, 13, they only scored 13 points against that team. Then Sam Houston State's 0 and 6. Yeah. A bad 0-6. Uh, they're, like you said, their best win was probably against Utah State. They won that game 39-21. Rolled up uh, San Jose State, a uh, 1-5 San Jose State team, 45-20, to and beat a not-so-good, I'm going to say pretty bad, San Diego State team. 2-4 and four, San Diego State. So been really bad. This is going to be Air Force's toughest test so far, and you look at Wyoming's schedule, they've been tested, folks. Yes. Texas Tech, Appalachian State, Texas, Fresno State. And a much improved New Mexico team that I would say would have a nice shot against San Jose, or San Diego State this year, San Jose State this year. Um, that's a much improved New Mexico team. Very so, much so. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you look at these numbers and they're just they're eye-popping, but I, I guess we're so used to playing Air Force and paying attention to them that they don't pop off the page per se to us. They are leading the FBS and rushing at 330 yards per game. Um, what's unbelievable to me and overlooked is their defense. Their defense has been incredible. They're, they're the second ranked defense in the FBS. They're only allowing 223.8 yards per game. Uh, three of the five opponents so far have scored 10 points or less. They're averaging, uh, they're allowing 12 points per game. They are also stopping everybody on third down. They are the best run stopping defense on, or the best third down defense in the country. Those numbers are incredible. They're on offense as well, they're the top third down conversion team in the country. However, is that because their schedule is so weak? I'm going to say it's 50 50. Yeah. <clears throat> you can roll up some nice stats against teams like that. Uh, Wyoming has their, we know that they're going to, it's going to be a tough game to get. Today, yeah, offensive line has got to be on. Andrew Peasley has got to be on, and on the defensive side, they have to read the pitches. They have to read the fullback. They have to do it all to a T, like you have to almost every time you play an Air Force team. You have to love, and this is really. They didn't talk about what the secret is to how they've been so successful against Air Force. Troy Calhoun certainly didn't give us anything, uh, but it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. The Cowboys in Craig Bowles' tenure have been so stout at the defensive tackle spot, which is where this whole thing is birthed. Last year, Brad Roberts led the country in rushing with more than 1,700 yards. In Laramie, he had 17 rushes for 56 yards, a season low by far. 
it all starts up front with the good bows of the world and the Jordan Bertinoli's of the world. If you can stuff that guy, uh, that's a hell of a good start. Don't, and Don't forget mustard gas. Yeah, mustard gas Florentine, of course. Yeah, no, all those guys in the middle. And that's where Craig, before the season started, he said, like a good baseball team, we're really good up the middle. Uh, going back to Easton Gibbs at middle linebacker, going back to the safeties. They're loaded, and they've had plenty of experience against this Air Force team. I don't know if this translated as well, Jared. I don't know if you saw it this week. I wrote a story. Uh, I talked to Aaron Bull, Wyoming's linebackers coach, and I, I posed this question to him. I said, pretend I'm a freshman linebacker, and the only thing I've ever seen in my life is spread offenses in high school. I had a decorated career, but I've never faced this monster before. What do you tell me where to even begin? And he said, if you see a little, you see a lot. That's where we preach to these guys. And he dumbed it down for me so much. And I don't know if it translated to paper as well as I it was translating in my head. But uh, basically, for the most part, Easton Gibbs locks in on who his guy. And it's his job to make sure that guy doesn't do anything. It's really, it's not that simple, but it's that simple. And in this particular game... Gibbs is more going to be the north-south mm-hmm. guy. Sui Anoa is going to be the east-west guy yeah. w- along with those safeties. Yep. But once again, you have to be aware of the pass game, and that's what got Air Force back into the game last year. They had two touchdown passes against Wyoming's defense. They did. And this quarterback is more effective than they were last year. So this is going to be an interesting battle today, and there's no doubt about that. But you did say it, it all starts up front on the offensive line and the defensive line. And I asked Colby Taylor, he didn't play in this game last year, of course, but how how do you not fall asleep? How hard is it to be a cornerback in this game and not fall asleep? Sure enough, every game somebody's running wide open. And it can be, like you said last year, they scored two touchdowns. Wyoming was Wyoming outrushed the Falcons last year. They had the time of possession last year. Those are things that do not happen against Air Force. If you recall, that first drive of the game was like a 13, 14, 15 play drive, and the Cowboys were just marching it only ended in a field goal but that was an air force-esque drive that took up damn near the entire first quarter and then at the end they ran the ball out on air force which is what they've done to teams for the last century it was a thing of beauty and if you recall that first series too was a lot of passes to alex brown um because they were and there and uh, cobs excuse josh me cobs, yeah, yeah josh cobs and they were they were playing 10 yards off the ball on them yep and i we were all like, what is going on here? <laughs> and, and sometimes you, you get frustrated at Wyoming's defense for doing that. But Wyoming defense is a bend but don't break defense. Yeah. They, they'll give up six yards on a pass play, but they're going to stuff them yep. the next two plays. Exactly. So It was weird. It was, and it was weird that it didn't change throughout the game. They gave a 10-yard cushion that entire game. Do we see that again tonight? I mean, how could you? But then... The Cowboys killed them. You have Body. You have Brown. Asante. And you have Asante. That are fast as heck, yeah. And maybe one of those guys gets open, yeah, over the top. We'll we'll see, of course. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, this this defense is really good for the Falcons, though, and they're they're always overlooked because how prolific this triple option attack is on the other side of the ball. But uh, they are stupid good. Um, back to the offense a little bit. Zach Larrier, he's a uh, senior quarterback. He waited in the wings behind Zeke Daniels, who was a three year starter. Um, so far, so good. 14 of 19 throwing, 410 yards, three touchdowns. He's also rushed. He's been their most efficient rusher, uh, 362 yards on just 62 carries, three touchdowns on the ground. Emmanuel Michelle, who you heard from earlier, 91 rushes, 400 yards, and eight touchdowns so far for the Falcons. Uh, they're just they're doing it and doing it and doing it well. But we just have to keep coming back to who they're doing it against. And they haven't faced – as a physical defense as Wyoming since probably last year's Wyoming game. That's what was so bizarre to hear that comment from Michelle. He knows better, right? He knows this defense is unlike anything they've seen. I mean, this like you talked about, this is not this is not your older brother San Diego State team they just beat up on. That team is bad. They're really bad across the board. And usually they had defense to hang their hat on, but they are really, really bad. Yeah, I <laughs> I Going to San Diego State, that I don't understand how they can get that bad. Uh, how have they never had a quarterback? Yeah. How? How, how, how? It's mind-boggling. Uh, here's Craig Bull, Wyoming's head coach, talking about this upcoming meeting with the Air Force Falcons. 
Uh, Air Force right now is typically they're they're undefeated. They're prolific on offense, averaging 38 points a game. They do have the ability to throw the ball along with running the football. They're great on third down, great on fourth down, and they're plus four in the turnover margin. Um, their quarterback, Larry Ur, I think is excellent. Another guy that's loaded up, and they always have a, a good fullback. Uh, Mitchell, I think, is a great fullback as well. They give us a lot of different formations and sets. Uh, their offensive coordinator has been there a long time. I think he's a, an academy graduate. At one time, had been on the faculty there. And so it's a classic gate case. Uh, Falcons are hard to play in Colorado Springs. Uh, but we've got a good football team, and we're going to be playing a good football team. Same old, same old. Lots of sets, lots of different plays, lots of motion in the backfield, different options all over the field. Same old, same old. Just some new guys doing it. Uh, we talked about it off the air, but uh, with Fresno State coming in last week, no Jay Kaner. They lost their starting Jordan Mims, their 1,400-yard running back. Uh, they lost their... Best receiver. Uh, certainly they were going to take a step back. They really haven't taken that much of a step back. Air Force lost to Zeke Daniels. They lost Brad Roberts, who led the country in rushing with 1,700 yards last year. They lost Cormier, their top outside target. Next man up. And that's just what this Air Force machine has always done. I mean, aside from the Morgan brothers, can you even name any Air Force quarterbacks, they're just kind of nameless. They just they all look the same. They all do the same stuff. D. Dallas is the one that D. Steps, Dallas, yeah. you know, stands out to me, but that's a long time ago. Yeah, 80s. I mean, he probably has grandkids playing now somewhere. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just – it's plug and play, and I know that's kind of discrediting what Air Force does, and I don't mean it that way, but it's just literally next dude up. It, it, they're not worried about losing a three-year senior. I know when I covered high school football uh, in the state of Wyoming at Glen Rock High School, they run the same option offense. And these kids, from the minute they're five years old playing with flags, they know the Glen Rock Herders' two play calls. (laughs) So by the time they get to high school, they got that thing down. I would like to attend an Air Force practice sometime, though, just to see how many times they run the same play to make sure that this is – Run to perfection. Yeah. You can see Troy with a whistle. Run it again. Run it again. <laughs> uh, you know, tall task. It's always a tall task against these guys. You mentioned it earlier. 30, 27, and 3 is the series. Um, Air Force has the three-game advantage. Every game's close. In the bowl era, all of these games, the winner has been decided by seven points or less. Uh, average. Sounds like a rivalry to me all the way around. Um, I expect a ton of Wyoming fans to be in Colorado Springs tonight. I expect it to be rowdy. Uh, That has never – I don't know how you feel about it, Jared, but that was never a venue that scared me as an opposing fan. I think I'd seen Wyoming win there more than any other road venue in the country. Um, It wasn't like walking into Hughes Stadium, which was – could be very intimidating. Um, Falcon Stadium is not that at all. I haven't heard what ticket sales are like, but I would have to imagine this is going to be the most I've probably ever seen at an Air Force game as far as close to capacity. Yeah. And a lot of that is they've, they're they doing some renovations to the stadium, so there's not as many seats right now mm-hmm. on that east side. But still, just with the number of Wyoming fans are going to go down and Air Force being 5-0 and and – Yes, folks, it's a rivalry. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I do believe that there's going to and weather's supposed to be pretty dang good today. You know, in the in the mid fifties at, at kickoff type of a deal. So, uh, I I do believe there's going to be as many people there as I've ever seen. Yeah, this little bit of trivia might win you an appetizer at Applebee's one night, Jared. Um, Andrew Peasley, according to Troy Calhoun, is the only player and the only quarterback for sure. That has been part of beating the Air Force Falcons twice with two different teams. And that's the era we're in now, and we're going to hear a hell of a lot more of that. Yeah, I was just going to say, you don't have to look back too far, probably. Shaven Cordero's beating Wyoming with Hawaii and San Jose State, for instance. But Andrew Peasley's the only one, Troy Calhoun said, that he thinks has beaten his team twice in two different uniforms. And for him to know that, that means that Andrew Peasley's on his mind. Paying attention a little bit. 
Uh, here is actually a quote, brief quote here from Troy Calhoun on Andrew Peasley. Like I said, I mean, an incredibly talented young man. I mean, when he plays, um, that's when their team plays the best. You know, I think um, you look at, you know, the games that they've won, just what a really what a tremendous factor he's been. He's right. When they play well, um, Andrew Peasley is a main cog in that and why they play so well. Um, in that 2021 game at the Academy, Peasley came in in the second half and tossed three second-half touchdown passes to help lead Utah State to a 49-45 win. That was the opening game of the Mountain West that year. It was an absolute barn burner back and forth. Logan Bonner got injured like he did so many times during that year, and uh, Peasley came in cold and and absolutely torched them. Hit Tompkins on a 72-yard touchdown pass, I believe. And uh, and then, of course, last year, uh, Peasley was 18-23 against the Falcons for 162 yards. He threw a touchdown. He did have a bad interception in that game, if you remember. Safety totally locked it down. Jumped the route. Jumped the route. Um, yeah, but the Cowboys come away with a 17-14 uh, win last year against Air Force. So, um, Peasley's a really good quarterback. And this team is going to go as he goes, no matter how important these running backs are, which they are. And he's just getting better and better each game. And we talked about it in the first segment. The confidence is there. And sometimes you look back at last year and a couple games this year, Maybe that he was lacking a little bit of that confidence, mm-hmm. but he truly believes in this team. The team believes in him. Yeah. And the coaching staff believes in him. No doubt. This is the best quarterback play I've seen at Wyoming in a really long time. Um, some of the throws last week were, like Craig Bull said, they were lasers. That throw that White Wheeling got lit up on in the end zone. That was a rocket, man. He put everything into that throw, and it looked really good. And the one to Gillenberg in the corner of the end zone as well. Beautiful. Right. I mean, the yeah. only place, who the only person who could catch it was him. Yep. yep. And it just happened to be and just didn't get control of it. He has not put the ball in danger at all in these last two weeks. Um, it's hard to believe that guy could only go 5 of 15 for 31 yards in a game against App State, which now we know we hear bull admitting that he probably shouldn't have played, probably wasn't ready. Uh, the shoulder sprain was still very much a real thing during that game. But, you know, and I had fans telling me that, like, he's clearly hurt. He's clearly not not at 100%. What do you want me to say? They've been telling me all week he's healthy, and uh, he performed better in practice than Evan Svoboda did. And, folks, when you just hear that comment, everybody knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. But I agree with you. It, he, he's been playing great, and he – Hopefully he can keep that up tonight. He's going to need to because it sounds like Harrison Whaley is not going to be in this game. Uh, don't hate that. I don't hate that. I mean, and this isn't confirmed, totally confirmed, but hearing from a pretty reliable source that, that he's probably not playing. Um, you like the backup situation, but I think even more so you like the fact that he's going to get a couple few weeks off, really, with the Cowboys having the bye week next week. Uh, a healthy Harrison Whaley against Boise State makes me feel a lot better than – uh, a not healthy Harrison Whaley against Air Force. And hopefully that means he's healthy for the rest of the year, too. Yeah. Instead of rushing him back and yeah. re aggravating something or doing more damage to whatever the injury is yep. type of a deal. Um, this Cowboy football team has a motto, and it's next guy up. Yep. Absolutely. And it's going to have to be, you know, Farrell, Sam Scott. Might see somebody else that we L. J. Richardson, <laughs> and and you, <laughs> and you might see a few more end arounds, which I don't like. I but hate them too. but then again, um, Sam Scott blocking for Andrew Peasley on those end arounds, yeah, or it's just those quick passes. Yep, yep. Like you said, the extension of the running yep. game. So. All right, Jared, let's go down. Uh, we got a couple minutes left here. Let's go down uh, through the Mountain West slate and some big games going on around the country today. UNLV Nevada playing for the Cannon. Um, in Reno. You know, these kind of scaring me. I got to be honest. I would really love to see Nevada figure something out here. They're not going to, but they're, no, they well, I would love to. It's a rivalry game. Yeah, true, true. Troy doesn't think anything is, but you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe those two coaches do. Uh, San Jose State at New Mexico. I think the Lobos, Lobos get it done. Absolutely. I, I'd love to see that game. Me I don't want to see him get going too much, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Boise State up in Fort Collins tonight. The CSU finally break the streak against the Broncos. No. <laughs> I don't even know if Torrey Horton's playing in that game. Mo Camara, that was a nightmare for the Rams last week in Logan. I loved it. <laughs> loved every minute of it. it was Get great. out to a 17-0 lead and lose it the way they did. Yep, uh, then San Diego State's out on the island um, in Honolulu. 
And then for the big games today, you know, game college game day, they followed the right the right, the right game for sure. Um, Oregon at Washington yeah, up in Seattle, a hell of a good game. And uh, you know, the few other. Whoops, I picked the wrong. I have the Pac-12 pulled up. Sorry, folks. Just bear with me for a second. That's how good the Pac-12's been this year. <laughs> I, I don't want to give them all that love, though. Uh, number one, Georgia at Vanderbilt. Go Commodores. Oh, God. <laughs> I wish. Uh, really, though, other other than that Pac-12 game, there's not a lot of ranked versus ranked teams, but some games that can make a lot of noise. A, a pretty decent Syracuse team at Florida State. Mm-hmm. Can they pull an upset? We'll see. Uh, Arkansas at Alabama, who knows? Crazy things happen there. Um, UMass is not going to beat Penn State today. <laughs> Just so you can take that one to the bank. That's your stone cold lock. <laughs> Even given forty two, I'd do that. One game in the SEC though, Texas A and M coming off a hard, you know, fought game loss against Alabama last week. They're at nineteen ranked uh, Tennessee. Um, I, that's probably the game of the day in the SEC. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, prediction time. I said last week that John Hoyland was going to add the one thing to his uh, resume that he didn't have yet, which was a walk-off game-winning field goal. Instead, he missed a field goal. I'm so glad it didn't come down to that, though. <laughs> Me too. However, it's going to come down to that tonight. And I see him booting. Not only is it, I, I see it being extra terrifying because the Cowboys are down. He kicks the game winning field goal. It's 24 23 walk off Cowboys win. Going to Boise State atop the Mountain West standings and in the top 25. I agree with your assessment that it's going to be a close game, a field goal game of some sort, and Wyoming wins by three. It's going to be a nail biter. It always is against these guys, isn't it? Uh, before we get off the air, I just want to say this is an unbelievable time of year for a sports fan. We've got playoff baseball, the NHL kicked off this week, NFL going strong, college football, hoops is around the corner. Jeff Linder and the guys are at Mountain West Media Days in Vegas uh, this week. I also want to wish a happy, happy off season to the Atlanta Braves and their phony fans. <laughs> uh, really excited for baseball right now, if you couldn't tell, and I know you are too, Houston Astros fan. Absolutely. It's going to be exciting. They're, they they did win the series against the Rangers this year, but I am I'm worried about the Rangers right now. Yeah, I'm not too keen on the D backs myself, but uh, hey, sent the Braves packing, so uh, all is right in the world. Uh, this has been the 7220sports.com kickoff show presented by the Brown and Gold. This show was also sponsored in part by Dickie's Barbecue Pit, Wyo Lotto, Papa Murphy's Pizza, Rocky Mountain Shirtworks, and Lovejoy's Bar and Grill. Thank you for joining us. For Jared Newland, I'm Cody Tucker. Stay tuned for Wyoming football next right here on KOWB.